Right. Good to see everyone. Um, we're in the room for some quite important conversations, aren't we? Something called climate change and saving the world. So um, I think we've got a lot to do here. You should always introduce yourself, should not you, before you start talking, so that's a cross for me so far. My name's Maria adibawali Schwarter. I am the CEO of the Foundation for Future London, which focuses on regeneration placemaking, and it's also very much committed to sustainable development, um, and also the SDG goals. Some of you will know of us because you're part of our boroughs, Waltham Forest, Hackney, Ewan, and um, Tower Hamlets. Today we have some audacious tasks and I think we should be slightly hard with each other about our questions so we get some real answers. But first of all, before I challenge you, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the London Climate Summit. And um, we're here today, I think you all know, to mark the 26th. I have to look down because I'm of that age where I can almost remember the 10th or the 12th, but I shouldn't say that. The 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference, the 26th. I think you would have to have had your kind of eyes closed, ears closed, and not be in any contact with the human world, not to know that climate change is a major, major issue. And that issue is totally important as well for London as a capital city to try and lead how not just the UK, but the world tackles climate change. So, I'm going to go through just a little bit more information about the day so you know what's coming and you know where you might want to prep for some of your questions, but also some answers, please. We're good sometimes at asking questions, but if you've got some solutions, some ideas from the projects that you're running, let us know. So again, good afternoon. As I just said many years ago, I used to work on environmental justice and climate change. And just to say that it's worth remembering that um, we had the Kyoto Protocol and now we have the Paris Agreement. And we sometimes think as cities, where's our role? But actually, internationally, locally, and London-wide, we've always recognised the, the, the role of cities absolutely crucial in tackling climate change. We have to understand that we're mobilising stronger and more ambitious climate change action. We can't do it on our own. This is also about civil society. It's about financial institutions. It's about local opportunities. And it's definitely about equality, equity, diversity and inclusion. It's also about protecting the planet. So I would like to say thank you to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, and also to London's Council um, and Georgina, Councillor Georgina Gold for being here because we know what your diaries are like. So here we go. This is what we're going to sit through. We're going to have a conversation um, by our Mayor Sadiq Khan and Councillor Georgina Gold. At, later on, we're going to outline the vision, or where not. Actually, the Mayor Sadiq Khan is going to help us with that one. We're then going to have a brilliant view of the film and move on from there to some opportunities talking to young people the next generation about what they're doing. Later, we're going to hear from the government and their thoughts, thinking, policy, and I hope investments in climate change post Glasgow. There'll be a panel discussion about business and community organizations, what we're doing, how we represent the people we work for, and also how we celebrate collective achievements. The City of London will talk about their action on climate change and the UK City's Climate Investment Commission. This is absolutely crucial for COP26 and for national leaders to understand what it means for cities to tackle climate change. We have some housekeeping. Um, these always make me smile when I have to read through these, but I'm going to tell you anyway. The fire alarm one doesn't make me smile. That's really serious. If you hear a fire alarm, I'm going to read it out. Um, if a fire alarm rings continuously, please make your way to the stairs. And I would say calmly, out to the main exit, and members of the Guildhall security team will assist us. Now, there's no breaks in this conversation, and I guess that's kind of say something about how important climate change is. But should you wish to take a break, 
Apparently, the toilets are located at the top of the stairs and to the left. So there you go. So I'm going to step aside and I'm going to introduce our host, as I said, the Mayor Sadiq Khan and Councillor Georgina Gold, to tell us a little bit more about their work on climate change and hopefully throw a few challenges to all of us. Thank you so much, Maria, for setting out uh, the big challenge we, we face today. And it's brilliant to see so many people in person to discuss this challenge and really to welcome you to, to London's Climate Summit. And as, as I think Maria set out, it, it is a critical moment for, for the world. Um, we, are, we are at a place where the, the climate crisis, if it ever was, was, is not something that's happening to us in the future. We're seeing it in our communities, whether it's the the flooding that we've seen in London or the wildfires that they've seen in, in Australia. Uh, it's an urgent challenge um, and it requires us to act now. And it's why I'm really just so proud of the action that London government has been taken um, and why I'm, I'm proud to stand here as chair of London councils with every single borough in London. I can see lots of borough leaders in the room uh, working on a climate action plan, taking real action, whether that's insulating homes, creating new cycle lanes, uh, working on uh, producing renewable energy for, for our, our buildings. That action is taken at every single part of, of our city. And we're also working alongside the, the Mayor of London and City Hall on a, a Green New Deal for, for London. Um, and government on, on bringing forward investment. And I don't think we've ever seen such a strong shared purpose um, from across London government on, mm -hmm. on, on the climate crisis. So we go into this COP with a, with a real um, uh, a set of ambitious um, asks for, for government, but also a clear record of achievement on the, on the climate crisis. And I think what's, what's really powerful for us as local government is our ability to be in communities, to work alongside businesses, schools, um, community organisations, and crucially our citizens, to take bottom-up action on the climate crisis. And we're really seeing that, that desire to be part of a solution from Londoners. A recent poll showed us that 82% of Londoners said they're concerned about the climate crisis, and 66% of Londoners have seen that increase over the last 12 months. And I know everyone will have their own story of that grassroots action happening in their communities. I was with uh, some school children who were doing food growing and talking to me about food waste uh, the other day um, with uh, other school children who are doing clothes swaps um, with community groups um, coming together around food co-ops, all to, to take action on the climate crisis. Um, but we do know that Londoners face huge issues um, post pandemic. We're seeing uh, high rates of poverty, unemployment, um, people are struggling to, to, to make ends meet, which can make the climate crisis a hard issue for, for, for people to deal with, which is why I think it's so important that when we address the climate crisis, we're doing that in a way that ensures a just transition. We're thinking about insulating homes, so we're reducing fuel poverty. We're creating new and good quality jobs uh, for Londoners, and we're making it easier for, for Londoners to buy affordable and healthy food locally and indeed grow that food themselves. Um, but we can only meet the scale of what's required if we build new partnerships and that's why i'm really delighted that as alongside london local government i know we've got business um, and and many different sectors in this room and it and it really is a, a joint partnership between us and we're also working with other cities um, we're going um, to cop as london councils to to launch uh, a, the uk cities climate investment commission report which is a, a partnership with cities around the uk that gives a real credible uh, path for investment in, in green infrastructure, in retrofit, um, and uh, I think helps us to, to come together um, and give a real offer to, to green finance about how we invest in, in meeting this huge challenge. Um, and government continues to be a critical partner for us. Um, uh, really looking forward to hearing from Minister Scully later today. And I know London boroughs have welcomed the net zero strategy in particular, the, particularly welcomed the focus on place. And I'm also really proud of the work we've been doing with the Mayor of London and the Deputy Mayor uh, for the Environment, Shirley Rodriguez, uh, whether it's supporting the circular economy on high streets um, or our, our ambitious Green New Deal to create, um, to double the number of green jobs in, in our city um, and to, to ensure that we have warm homes for Londoners uh, as part of our Green New Deal mission. 
And I think we've we've worked together um, as as a city in an extraordinary way to to respond to COVID. We have you know um, come together to to save lives and and shown that really strong purpose when we can work together across party. And I think the 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 call for us all is to do the same thing um, in this in this challenge of a climate crisis, which is just as urgent as as the public health emergency we've just been through. Uh, so I have huge hopes for the discussion today. Looking forward to, to listening. Um, but uh, before before that, I'm really delighted to to um, hand over to our co-host for the evening, uh, Mayor Sadiq Khan, who has been leading this in London, but is now going to be leading this work for cities around the globe as chair of, of C40. So over over to to Sadiq. Thank you, Peter. Well, look, thank you, uh, uh, Georgia, for that kind uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you, Georgia, for your leadership of uh, London Council. It is lovely to see so many London Council leaders and uh, mayors in person. Uh, I can't pretend I've always felt that way. Uh, but it's lovely to see uh, many of you here uh, today, genuinely. And welcome to everyone, uh, those of you attending virtually, as well as those of you here in uh, Guildhall, those of you attending virtually, you've missed out some great drinks and uh, food, I'm only joking. Um, it's heartening to bring together so many people from business, government, councils, the private sector and community leaders who share our goals and ambitions to tackle the climate emergency. In fact, uh, I'll be here on Sunday hosting mayors from across the globe uh, as we approach uh, COP26 in Glasgow uh, over the next few days. Look, as mayor, I'm very aware uh, that City Hall uh, can't tackle this climate crisis alone. It will take a lot of teamwork and hard work together. But if we succeed, the rewards will be huge. We can create stable, well-paid jobs for Londoners. We can make our city greener and healthier, and we can deliver a strong, green, fair recovery from the pandemic. My aim, with your support, is to make London the world's first zero carbon city of its size by 2030. We've set out a Green New Deal for London with the goal of doubling London's green economy to £100 billion within the next decade. As part of this, we're electrifying our bus and taxi fleets, divesting pension funds from fossil fuels and undertaking a retrofit revolution to make London's buildings more energy efficient. We're increasing the number of electric vehicle charging points. We're making our city easier and safer to get around for cyclists. We've already increased dedicated cycle lanes fivefold. We're taking world leading action to tackle air pollution too. Two years ago, we introduced the world's first ultra low emission zone in central London. This has already reduced toxic pollution by a half. But air pollution is still causing too much damage and too many cases of lethal and debilitating illness, including cancer, heart disease, and dementia. In some parts of our city, children are still growing up with stunted lungs and chronic respiratory conditions as a direct consequence of pair poor air quality. And that's why this week we expanded the ultra low emission zone to the north and south circular roads, an area 18 times larger than currently covered by the central zone and twice the population of Paris. We're making great progress in London, but we're never going to be able to solve this problem alone. We need the government to unlock the power and funding needed to meet our targets, something we sadly didn't see in yesterday's budget and spending review. And we need much greater international action. With COP26 starting in just a few days, 
we are all naturally thinking of this bigger picture. This is a key moment for world leaders to show real leadership, to show the same kind of leadership that major cities like London, with great partnership from you, have been showing in recent years. As George has said, I was recently elected the global chair of C40, a global network of cities committed to meaningful action on the climate emergency. And it's great that the chief executive, Mark Watts, has joined us for today as well. I'm proud to be leading such a powerful movement of major cities, which represents more than 700 million people and more than a quarter of the global economy. I plan to use this incredible platform to support climate action in London, in other cities around the world, and to put pressure on national governments to take the action we desperately need. Let me end my short remarks today with this. You know, with all the high level talk around targets and negotiations for COP26, it's quite easy to lose touch with what climate action means at the most local level. For me, it means not only how we can reduce our emissions, but how we can improve our natural environment and find ways to reduce health and social inequalities. The Green New Deal for London aims to do exactly that. And I'm really pleased with the progress we've made on the London Recovery Board with Georgia as the co-chair and the rest of the board who are here with us today. As part of the Green New Deal, we've set up a new programme called Future Neighbourhoods 2030. This will support neighbourhoods in London to become models for what the Green New Deal really means at a local neighbourhood level. Londoners genuinely want to be part of the solution, and that's amazing to see. And today, I'm announcing funding of £1.4 million to two proposals that really stood out for their exciting long-term visions with a total of £7.5 million in the programme over the next three years. The competition was tough. The winning proposals came from Summerstown in Camden and Nottingdale in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. And I'm so pleased to have members of those communities here today. Let's please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> we'll be watching your communities with a huge amount of interest and genuine excitement as well. I'm now going to hand back to Maria, who's going to introduce a, sh a short video on the future neighbourhood projects. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you. I think that just illustrates the ambition for London, doesn't it, and collaboration already in this first sort of start of the conversation. Um, one of the things that I do in my day job is um, we fund creativity, um, art and culture in the new cultural quarter of East Bank, which we are, should say thank you to City Hall for being one of the major investors, but also committed to that whole programme of social value regeneration, i.e. regeneration that's good for the economy and local people. The thing that we do collaboratively is work with culture, art, innovation, and that brings in as part of a 1.5 billion economy, the creative sector. So the reason why I say this is because we're going to see a film and we tend to see films and not really think about it. It's another way of, I guess, translating a conversation, a story. But I think actually this film is an illustration of how we can talk about climate change over and beyond figures and reports. And um, what we're finding is actually we have amazing filmmakers, um, both in the boroughs that we work with, but just across London, young and old. So here we are introducing the Our Futures Neighbourhoods film. Um, I've got written here, the film is powerful and creative. Well, I've got no doubt about that. Um, it's going to convey the climate change emergency, um, the climate emergency, which we know is a real thing. It is a real thing. I'm just reminding people because apparently we're on Zoom and I just want other people to remember it. It is a real thing, we know, but some people maybe are disagreeing about that. So let's go ahead and watch the film and maybe have a bit of a conversation later. Um, it's a showcase and um, I'm pleased that we're going to be seeing it here, talking about zero waste, 
zero pollution at a local level and how we deal with that. Thank you. Ever wondered how your neighbourhood might change in the next 10 years? As London and the world faces up to the climate emergency, what will it mean for the places we live, work and play in? In truth, we're already seeing the impact of a changing climate on our city. Heat waves and flash flooding are happening more often and causing huge disruption. Nearly 200,000 homes and workplaces in London are either at high or medium risk of flooding. This puts more than 1 million Londoners at risk, with the worst impacts felt by the most vulnerable. So what can be done? We must quickly phase out polluting fossil fuels and invest in renewables. Find cleaner, healthier ways to move around our city. Adapt to extreme heat and heavy rainfall. Waste less and reuse more. Protect what we love about our amazing city. That means addressing carbon emissions from human activity. How we heat and power our homes generates about a third of London's emissions. A third comes from workplaces and a quarter from transport. The good news is, we already have the technology and ambition to tackle this. Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has set a target to bring London's emissions down to net zero by 2030. His Future Neighbourhoods programme is helping to make this vision of a cleaner, greener city a reality. This means retrofitting older, energy inefficient houses and flats so they become ultra low carbon homes with affordable energy bills. It means maximising use of renewable energy, solar panels on rooftops and heat networks so communities have their own cost effective energy sources that don't rely on fossil fuels. Cleaning up our toxic air by providing safer, greener walking and cycling routes for all Londoners and making electric vehicle charging public transport and car sharing more accessible. It means making our homes and streets greener, tackling flood risk, keeping us cool and supporting nature. It also means wasting less and reusing, repairing and sharing more, maybe even growing our own. These changes will help deliver new green jobs and skills and enable local green economic growth and innovation. We must prioritise the disadvantaged groups most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, the same groups who were hit hardest by the pandemic. We're working with communities to co-design solutions to create the greener, cleaner neighbourhoods of the future. Climate action is not about restricting our way of life. It's about protecting the things we love the most. Making positive changes to our homes and streets will benefit everyone, particularly those Londoners who feel the worst effects of toxic air and climate change. We've already made great progress through cleaning the air with the ultra low emission zone to ensuring all new developments are net zero carbon through the London plan. Future Neighbourhoods is about demonstrating our ambitious plans for 2030 today, ensuring our city is greener, healthier and more resilient. So we've been talking about the future, haven't we? So we've got um, two members of the future, as in younger than most of us, sorry, it's just the way it is. Um, and they've been working with young people in London around climate action, around democratisation of young children's voices being heard and younger people. And so I'm going to introduce you to you. I'm going to read these again, the bio, so I get them right and I don't miss anything. So Harry. Harry Rushworth is the chair of the Youth Panel for Transport for London. And I have to say, I'm impressed at some of the work he's been doing and just helping to advocate for under 25s, but also working on cycle lanes and supporting the implementation of people, sorry, the implementation um, of the important Vision Zero. Um, and also protecting pedestrians and cyclists. And I do thank you for that, because I've recently got back on my bike with my kids and we've actually got a cycle lane where I live, which we never had before. So I'm, I'm going to say you're part of that, Harry. Um, I don't know if you are, but just take, just take the comments. <laughs> um, OK, and um, also we have Amy. Amy, Amy Bull, Head of Digital Communications and Votes for Schools. She does amazing work as well. Amy has been a teacher in London, but she's now working with Votes for Schools, which I think is a really brilliant agenda, actually. And it's about presenting young people because, again, they're not in this room and they're very rarely in a room where decision-making gets taken. 
It's views from, she works with views and considerations from four to 16 year olds, which I'm really happy that it's four year olds because we tend to go for older people, but four year olds are very good at telling us how it is. Um, or maybe that's just mine. Anyway, um, so let's hear a little bit more about what you do. I have some questions, um, but first of all, Harry, um, why don't you just say a little bit about what you do? And then I'm going to go to Amy and I have three questions. Oh, thank you. But thank you very much for that introduction, Maria. Um, as you said, I'm Harry Rushworth, I'm chairman of the Transport Flood Youth Panel. I, I should stress we are independent, this is my own voice, this is not the voice of TfL. Um, but I've, I've been engaged with uh, youth engagement on transport for a number of years now. I've been on the panel since 2014-2015. Uh, Before that, um, I was active in schools, uh, supporting travel plans, getting people uh, away from being dropped off in a car to moving onto bikes, uh, walking and active travel. I've also done a lot of work around uh, getting young people from disadvantaged backgrounds into work through the Prince's Trust and uh, getting young people into politics through the Patchwork Foundation. Um, I think it's really important and vital work, which is why I do it so much. And I really like trains, hence the transport connection. <laughs> That's good. Okay, Amy, do you want to do a quick introduction and then I'm going to go into the questions? Yes, of course. Um, my name is Amy and as Maria said, I was a teacher in the London Borough of Barton and Dagenham for a number of years before I moved over to Folks for Schools. And I happened to find Folks for Schools whilst working on a project with my year four class all about climate change. And I was completely amazed by how brilliant they were, how quickly they picked up things and made connections and how many opinions that they had, but also how difficult it was for them to be heard. They were really lucky that they had a local councillor come in and listen to their questions. And in the background, I then discovered Folks for Schools, who are a company that are all about listening to young people's voices. They pose them a question each week, whether that be on climate change or something else. They give them an unbiased lesson. And at the end, they ask them to vote. And children across the whole country, and many, many children in London, vote and make a comment on that issue of the week. They've got some amazing, amazing comments that I'll tell you from what they've said recently about climate change, but not just recently, also over the last few years. Okay, thank you. So I have a question. Um, you're working with young people and um, you are young people, you're younger than most of us. What do you think London 2030 looks like if you were to look into the future? And what does it look like for the young people that you're working with? I think I, there's two points of that. If we all do things right, what does it look like? And if we don't and we fail, what does it look like? I'm gonna start with... Um, one, of, one of my favorite quotes about this city is, London is not a city, it is a city of villages. Mm -hmm. And it's, I forget who said it, it's quite old, but um, it might not be... You said it. Very good, thank oh, you. Um, um, I'd like to know your name. Wonderful. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> um, <laughs> he wasn't paid, by the way. No, at the time. no, no. I'm independent. Um, what, what if, and I, I think it, it's not perhaps as common today with such a metropolis and as we grow and lots of areas ever look similar, but I don't think it's a bad ambition to get back to that. If we look at Barcelona, Paris, for a number of years now, they've been very far ahead in 15 minute neighborhoods. The idea that no matter where you live in a city, within a 15 minute walk or bike ride, not by car, importantly, you can access all the services you need, healthcare, education, uh, shopping, without having any dependency on vehicles or other transport needs. And I think that is a, a fantastic uh, ambition to have, to get London in 2030, where every single resident in the city can access every service they need within a 15 minute walk. And um, it leads to healthier people, uh, better opportunities for people, uh, better quality of life. Um, and, and part of that is also, getting cars out of the city to enable that to happen. And, you know, a lot of people in recent weeks have been complaining about the ULES. Um, among young people, I haven't heard one complaint, honestly. Um, it, it's a policy that people recognize. We need to deal with air pollution. It is often near schools where you have significant pollution, particularly with school run. I think that's a fantastic area to work on. Uh, Vision Zero, as uh, was mentioned by Maria there, um, the idea that we should be tackling HTVs, uh, buses that are driving dangerously and make sure that we're putting the pedestrian first. There is no reason in the 21st century why a person should have to die uh, on the roads as a pedestrian. 
or anything else for that matter. Um, so active travel is really important, making sure the neighbourhoods we build are mixed use, making sure that they're, they're dense around urban transport hubs, um, pull, pulling back the amount of parking spaces to enable that transition to happen. Um, and and all, all of these things lend themselves to happier, happier, healthier city. Um, I think if we, if we don't go down that route, London is growing, everyone accepts that. We're getting more houses, we're getting more people. If we don't start now thinking how we can move to nobody needing a car in this city, we're just gonna get more cars and we all know how congested London is. We don't have the wide streets other cities have. Uh, and this is, this is about planning for the future. After all, electric cars may be greener than petrol cars, but they still take up the same amount of space and they're still as damaging to everyone else. Thank you. Amy? I think Harry covered it absolutely brilliantly and quite simply what we'd like London to look like is the video that we've just mm -hmm. seen. That's the London that we'd like to see and the London that I think we're all passionate about getting to. I think there's just a very big concern of will we get there and will we get there in time? Okay, that's well. I was going to say fingers crossed but we need to do a lot more than that, don't we? Um, okay, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about you're, you're seen as leaders, whether you like that title or not. Um, oh, yeah, I can see you don't, but anyway, um, it's in my notes. So, <laughs> and I can see having spoken to you in your answers that you are, so, you know, own it. Um, tell us a little bit more about some of the school surveys that you're doing, Amy, uh, and, and what's coming out of that. Yeah, of course. So. Most of the schools have been asking young people for their opinions for years, but in a massive, massive survey that's been done just this academic year since September, in partnership with the UK Committee for UNICEF, we asked 46,000 young people for their thoughts on climate change. And we asked them a range of questions and really tried to understand what they thought and what they wanted to see, where their concerns were. And Sorry, did you ask me about what they'd like to see from leaders? Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm sure some of that came out in the research. So. It, that's on. exactly what came out of the leaders' research. One of the biggest things that came out of it was that they really want to see more <coughs> action. So to give you an example, 93% uh, of young people in London said that not enough was being done about climate change. And one 12 year old Londoner left this <coughs> comment, which I think summed up the thoughts of so many. They said, Everyone is spending so much time thinking about what is going on and talking about it, but not taking enough action. They don't want to see small actions either. Someone else wrote that no amount of cycling to work or short showers is going to solve the problem when they reference the carbon majors report in 2017 here, because you've got 100 corporations responsible for 70% of emissions. So they were very, very clear on what they wanted to say. They had a lot of solutions too, though. There are a lot of things they wanted to see. Um, one of the big things they wanted to see for local councillors here today is they would like to have local climate councils in schools. They would like the opportunity to meet with their councillors and to bring their communities together to discuss their concerns and have their voices heard. Someone else had a great idea for having a sustainability mark on packaging. So as consumers, you can immediately understand the impact that that thing you're buying has had on on the environment. They wanted laws against overfishing, against over farming. They wanted more wildflowers across London. It was a really, a really nice one. They'd like campaigns to reduce the amount of meat that we eat. And someone even suggested that we had a national day every year whereby we couldn't drive any petrol or diesel cars to show us what the future looked like. They had so many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not gonna tell you all of them because I will be here all day. But I think two really big things to pull out of it is firstly that these ideas are not just now, they're not just because COP's coming up. I've got many examples over the last few years I could give you on different things. But also a really worrying statistic, both two years ago and again this September, was that 80% of young people in London said they didn't think that leaders were listening to them. So they know what they want from you. They just don't believe that you're going to listen to them or deliver it. Okay, well, that's a challenge, isn't it? Um, Harry, could you tell us a little bit more about the, some of the initiatives that you're doing um, with TfL Youth Panel and the impact that COVID has had on some of that? Um, so we've been 
Uh, over, over the years, we've done a lot of work um, responding to consultations, advocating for uh, active travel programs within TfL and other bodies. Um, uh, safety has always been a big one for us. Um, safety at night for young people. Um, and I know uh, I, some of the events of the past year that might be more acute these days um, as a concern. Um, we've also helped a lot of younger people um, into engineering backgrounds, uh, into engineering from disadvantaged backgrounds, I should say. Um, because we know there's a, a shortage of um, individuals in the STEM industries across the country. And I think uh, as we go forward, particularly with needing to transition the economy to a new way of working, that is even going to become more of a problem. Um, we've kind of stepped back a bit over the duration of COVID because of um, uh, the, ability, the inability to meet in person and obviously prioritizing um, delivery work rather than engagement. Um, so that's something I think we'd like to get back on and do a bit more. Um, I think one of the important things, particularly now, is not to step back from engaging young people. Um, I think it's really important that we do that, yeah. um, particularly as COVID has led to such a big drastic change in the way we do things. And as we need to move to a net zero economy, that change is just going to grow and grow and grow. Yeah. Sorry, I'm taking a breath because I'm just listening to that and what the impact will be for you know, having to step away from all that work that you're doing. And I imagine that human contact and those conversations are really important. I think young people are kind of very much impacted by that, especially if you don't have resources. That's what we're finding in, in the foundation. Um, I have a few more questions here and I'm, I'm hoping we've got time. I'm going to look to colleagues, but I have. I've got a nod, so that's good. Um, there's quite a few things here, but I'm just going to go back to um, personal views. I'm going to read the question out, actually. Um, you will have personal views on sort of how we've been tackling uh, climate change or not. Um, and Harry, you have been looking at the intersection, at least I've been told, um, around housing policy as well. And you mentioned already the fact that you know London is getting bigger, we're building houses, are we building them in the right way, are we building them for the future, and does everyone get actually access to these new houses? Could you tell us just a little bit more about that? Um, yep, yeah, can do. So one of, one of the things we know with the climate is that with such drastic change there are effects on every other part of society, and uh, as it, from, from droughts, uh, flooding, um, you know, the, the costs and the ramifications are enormous and the need to mitigate them. Um, but that means the solutions are also very broad as well. Mm. So one, one of the areas obviously that is a major problem in the UK at the moment is housing. Except when we as a society and as a country build housing, most of the time it's our build a new garden town. We're going to take grade one farmland, put car centric cutter cutter estates out in the countryside, and then everyone's going to commute to London and work. Um, the reality is these aren't Green, these aren't efficient, these aren't a good use of land. Um, we know that denser areas, London, uh, inner Birmingham, inner Manchester, are, uh, require less energy to power a property of the same size. Uh, people are less likely to be car dependent. People are more likely to engage in active travel, moving about. Um, and I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity there, not just to reduce uh, the emissions and costs of housing, um, but to provide more affordable housing if we use policies um, such as street votes that densify and allow people to uh, provide more housing within the areas that need it most. And that's one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate for uh, transit oriented development. Mm -hmm. um, London, I've lived in many parts of central London. Um, I've never needed a car in central London, even as far out as zone three, zone four. Um, and I think young people today, we see increasing, sorry, more and more drops in the share of car ownership and share of people who are qualified with licenses. And it's quite depressing to then see a uh, shortage of housing and an increase in car usage and things like low traffic neighbourhoods then being rolled back, which is almost a self-defeating cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw a challenge at you because I can hear one of my colleagues probably just saying that's absolutely true, what you just said about housing and the importance of building it better and wiser as part of the whole planning of a neighbourhood. How do you make sure planning takes into account actually inequality and that we build for everyone? even around even the design of a home or the design of a neighborhood how do we ensure that regeneration is led by social values which create those kind of homes for everyone um a number of reasons uh, a number of uh, there's a number of ways i should say um making sure developments are permeable that they integrate 
um, as well as they can with existing urban fabric nearby, um, rather than presenting sort of dead ends. That makes it a lot pe easier for people who can't afford cars or people who are less able to walk. Um, making sure that the developments we build uh, slow down cars or minimize car usage. Um, lighting, making sure areas feel safe. Uh, greenery, um, we know that people who live in greener areas generally have better health. And that is a really important thing that I think uh, provides benefits far beyond just having a house. Um, and generally building more houses. There's, there's, there's always a case that I, I always frustrates me I might be young, but when you see developments that are rejected because there's not enough affordable housing and then the development comes back with less houses overall, but more affordable. Yes, that's good for affordable, but that's still less houses. And we know there's a problem with housing stock overall. So we need to get the balance right. OK, so we're going to have a conversation a bit later about retrofitting, etc. So maybe you can join I'll that. Yes, I'm sure you will. Good. Amy. Um, what what's your plans in the future for the work that you do with young people where do you want to move with all this data and knowledge equity from young kids where do you want to go with it because it's, it's really exciting good question um, <laughs> at the moment we are on a mission to make sure that these children's voices are heard uh, we made a promise when we asked them to take part in the lessons to take part in the vote that we would get their voices to cop and we are on a mission to do that in the future i think we would like to see more involvement for them. It's clear from the information they give us week on and week, week out that they really have quite a good understanding mm. of the world that they're growing up in and they want to have a say in it. So we try already to get our counsellors into schools, to get our groups in and to really give these children an input from their leaders and to try and change that statistic so that they believe that their leaders are listening to them. But obviously we can't do that alone. Okay, thank you. I, I did notice that I think City Hall have brought some very young leaders, um, some young sort of young mayors um, of a sort who are working on um, quite a few issues with City Hall. Is that right? I'm looking to Shirley, but I shouldn't because I, <laughs> I don't know why I'm looking at you, because I know you. Um, okay, well, we can go back to that. If anyone knows, let me know, because I might have misread it. It might be another city, but I think it was London that was looking at um, very young sort of mayors or certainly advisors to, to. what do you think about that actually i think it'd be great i think you'd have a lot of children that are sort of young activists that would love to get involved and would love to be able to schools all have school councils nowadays and school parliaments so they do that already in their schools it would be nice to give them a, a vehicle to take that opinion further themselves great i'm going to stop there because i'm getting the wave which means we're about to go to the pre-recording um, so I would like to introduce um, a conversation um, which is about to happen, hopefully, which is with Paul Scully. Um, he is the Parliamentary Under Secretary of, the St of State for Bayes and Minister for London on the partnership between government and London delivering net zero. So I think that's going to be a video. And Thank you for inviting me to speak at this vital event ahead of the COP26 Climate Summit next week. Achieving our net zero target must be a shared endeavour, requiring action from everybody in society, in businesses, in governments, that's national government, local government, big business and small business, communities and individuals coming together and doing their bit. And we've achieved a lot of on our, on our road to net zero already. Between 1990 and 2019, we grew our economy by 78% but also cut our emissions by 44%, decarbonising faster than any other G7 country. Over the past year alone, we've published the Prime Minister's 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution, the Energy White Paper, the North Sea Transition Deal, the Industrial Decarbonisation Strategy, the Transport Decarbonisation Plan, the Hydrogen Strategy, and most re recently, our Heat and Building Strategy and Net Zero Strategy. Now, all of these work together not only just to send us in the right, the right direction, but also to, to start, develop and create new markets and reduce costs through technology and through the free market. But however, the science couldn't be clearer that we need to continue our efforts. By the middle of this century, the world needs to reduce emissions to as close to zero as possible, with a small amount remaining sucked up through natural carbon sinks like forests and new technologies like carbon capture. 
And that's why we published the Net Zero Strategy as our roadmap to do just this. It delivers a comprehensive set of measures to support and capitalise on the UK's transition to net zero by 2050, outlining measures to transition to a green and sustainable future. And this includes helping businesses and consumers to move to clean power, supporting hundreds of thousands of well-paid jobs and leveraging up to £90 billion worth of private investment by 2030. The strategy maps out our path to net zero, including actions to keep us on track for meeting our current carbon budgets and our 2030 nationally determined contribution. We're proud to lead the world in ending our own, uh, our own contribution to climate change, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we're determined to seize the unprecedented economic opportunity it brings. We want to build back better from the pandemic by building back greener and levelling up our country with new, highly skilled, high wage, sustainable jobs in every part of the United Kingdom. I know that local authorities can and do play an essential role in driving local climate action with significant influence in many of the national priorities across energy, housing and transport, which will be needed to achieve net zero. And I've been working closely with the GLA and London councils through the London Recovery Board on its economic recovery framework, setting out the actions it will take alongside stakeholders in encouraging recovery from COVID. In each of these areas, achieving net zero <clears throat> and actions to support the green economy are vitally important. We know that London is a magnet for, for, for global investment into the UK. And clearly, as we move to making sure that investment is attracted to the green industrial revolution up and down the UK, London will play a huge part in securing that net zero role. But businesses through London are doing their, their bit as well, whether it's retrofitting, whether it's playing their, um, their small parts in changing their energy use and automation uh, and, and other work to, to reduce their emissions. Um, but also at government's level, at each different stage, our transport uh, strategy, like the hydrogen buses that are coming on board and reduced car use, all of these things will mean that we're working together to play our role. But I know that across the UK, our local areas have also made great strides towards our net zero future. Throughout the UK, there were really good examples of local action, innovation and excellence. So it's important that we continue to build on the excellent progress that's made so far. Our net zero strategy delivers a comprehensive set of measures to support and capitalise on the UK's transition to net zero by 2050. It sets the link between UK's net zero agenda and international climate action. And when the UK was confirmed as host of COP26, less than 30% of global GDP was signed up to net zero or carbon neutrality targets. Today, in part again because of the UK leadership, that figure is now more than 80% and rising. However, the world is still not on track to reach the Paris Agreement temperature goal, which aims to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees centigrade and pursue efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade compared to pre-industrial levels. This week in Glasgow, we'll bring together world leaders, climate experts, business leaders and citizens to agree ambitious action to tackle climate change. Our Prime Minister will lead by example and call on other world economies to set out their own domestic plans for cutting emissions. This will be the moment that we secure our path to global net zero emissions by 2050 and we'll def define the next decade of working together to deliver climate action. I know that many of you here are leading the way on innovation as innovative solutions to end, aid the transition to net zero. And I'm so grateful for your contribution to ensure that we achieve that goal. The real work starts now. And I'm really looking forward to continuing working with you all to ensure that we achieve net zero by 2050. Right. So the real work starts now, um, and that includes a panel who's going to help answer some of those tricky questions, I hope, and um, give some candid answers. Uh, we all know about the SDGs. We know why they're there and how we should be committing to them. We know that they cover both social, economic politics of actually getting environmental, uh, the climate back to a healthy situation um, for both humans and the biosphere. So I would like to introduce, I'm trying to stick to time. So I've got a nod there, I'm doing okay. 
Um, so I would like to introduce uh, panel's members um, for the conversation um, and to answer some questions, I think. And we're gonna be focusing on issues around retrofitting, transport, air quality, green economy, the Green New Deal. And I'm also gonna throw a little one in there because we talk about the environment sustainable development, but I think sometimes we forget other industries such as the creative industry, um, et cetera, who actually help tell a story about climate change in the way that we sometimes don't when we're so focused on our language of climate change and sustainability. So can I introduce to the floor or to the stage actually, Councillor Ravi Gavindia. Hello. Councillor Darren Rodwell, leader of Barking and Dagenham Council. And I'm sorry, Councillor Ravi, I should have said leader of Wandsworth Council. Yes. Councillor Gareth Roberts, leader of Richmond Council. Ashin Kabar Rashid, co-founder, director, CEO of Repowering. Good to see you. Judith Everett, chair, CBI London Council. Welcome, Judith. And Tom Rockridge, co-founder and director of strategy of innovation at Paper Round. Right. I'm wondering if I can trust you to have like 30 seconds each to say a little bit about why you're here. Can I trust you to that? Can I trust you to know that we will check everything else about your organisation and who you are on, I don't know, some electronic equipment somewhere, phones, etc. So um, I'm going to start here. Um, Judith, could you just briefly tell us a little bit about what you do while you're here? Yeah, sure. Oh, that's loud enough. Um, hi, I'm Judith Everett and I'm here wearing two hats. One is as chair of the CBI's London Council um, and also as the leader of uh, purpose, sustainability and stakeholder at the Crown Estate. And this is such an important topic, not only for us at the CBI and the conversations we have as members of that organisation, but also for me in my, in my day job and what we're doing as, as a company that returns profit to the nation for all our benefits. And sustainability is really huge in our strategy going forward. So great opportunity to come and speak to people and in real life as well, which is an extra treat. Great. So I'm going to go for the listener because I can't see all your labels and my memory is dreadful. So I've just forgotten who each person is as important as you are. So um, I'm going to go to Councillor Ravi Gavinder. Well, Maria, I'm leader of the Council, but I'm here primarily as one of the three leaders of London within London Councils. Because this is such an important issue, and it's an issue of universal importance to all Londoners, that we sit together despite our political differences on this issue without any difference. Thank you. Tom. Hi, yeah, I'm Tom Mockridge. I am a, a director at Paper Round, which is a company I was involved in setting up 30 years ago as a Friends of the Earth project to recycle high quality paper from London offices. We're now a full service London waste, commercial waste provider. And I think I'm here to talk about the green economy and growing back better. Okay, thank you. Efshin, tell us a little bit about your work repowering. So at repowering, we empower local residents and work with communities to create their own uh, low carbon futures. So I'm here really to represent the voice of those communities who have an active and important role to play in get us getting to net zero, equally also ensuring that it's fair and we're addressing uh, the environmental and social injustices. Thank you. Um, Darren, Council Darren Rodwell. Obviously you said I'm the leader of Barking and Dagenham Council, um, but more importantly I'm a father and a grandfather and I want a future for my children and my grandchildren and whatever comes after that. Um, it's really important that we understand that there is only one planet and then, as Ravi said, politically we're aligned on this. Uh, it's about the future of every human being and every other uh, species that we have on this great planet and um, we've got to take this situation really seriously mm -hmm. and everything starts for me at the home. Um, not only have we got to build back better, safer, it also has to be greener uh, and more sustainable. And, and we've got lessons of the past that actually can help us develop for the future. Thank you. Councillor Darren Rodwell. 
No, that was him. That was me. You just said that. You just said that, haven't you? I know who yeah. you are. And um, that's what happens when you read your list out of order. Yeah. So please put your hand up if I haven't asked you, and I've been very rude. Then there's still my name's Gareth Roberts. Thank Hello, you, Gareth. I'm the leader of. Uh, I've, I've been getting Darren and Gareth mixed up for 50 years. Um, so my name's Gareth Roberts. I'm the leader of the London Borough of Richmond upon Thames, and I'm here because this is the single biggest um, challenge which we face in a political and uh, social level. And whilst government may be able to offer guidance, as we all know, all politics is local. It's we who will deliver leadership following the guidance given to us by government. Thank you. And I'm going to continue there, actually, because I have a question for everyone. But I'm going to start with you, if that's OK. Yes. Um, sustainability. Um, tell us how that goes hand in hand with place and place making within your borough, the work that you do. Well, we're very fortunate in Richmond upon Thames that we have, um, we seem to have about half a dozen royal parks thrown in. We've got the uh, Royal Botanic Gardens. We have, you know, an enormous amount of green open space. Uh, but what we also have is the challenge of a, a rather old borough. Um, some of the properties dating back you know, half a millennium in some terms. So what we have to try to ensure is that whilst we are respecting the existing built environment and the built heritage, that as far as we possibly can, that we adopt new ways of thinking about how we ad address the, you know, the real problems that they create. So we're, about, we're going to be hearing about retrofitting of buildings. It's difficult to retrofit Hampton Court Palace. Um, but it's all about making sure that those small steps, those small incremental steps that we can encourage local residents to take and that we can guide and show leadership on, it's about making sure that we take the difficult decisions. It's not going to be easy by any means, mm. but we do need to be, be able to show that we are taking those steps. Sorry, that was quite waffly. Um, no. But I'm a politician. It's so fine. Yeah, you said that, not me. Yeah, that's um, right. But showing leadership, I think, is something that's really crucial, isn't it? Yeah, I, and we all know situation. that the, you know, the ballot box is sort of whistling around in about eight months' time. And yeah. it's whether we actually keep up the momentum, which all councils are showing at the moment, or whether we start entrenching and hoping to get some form of uh, electoral popularity. And we can't allow that. If, no. it, if it means losing, it means losing. But we have to make sure that we're showing the leadership. I think that's the first time I've heard a politician say that. It's um, welcome. <laughs> okay, um, Judith, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. I know you introduced um, yourself and, and the work that you're doing, but, but tell us, look at Crown Estate, what does a stakeholder mean, been a good stakeholder around sustainability? Yeah, so if I talk about some of the work that we're doing as a Crown Estate, because there's two us, and I'll also cover the CBI because there's a broad membership in that, but the Crown Estate has quite a wide range of activity. We're a real estate company and that we own a big chunk of central London, but we also have assets outside of London, um, around the UK, in England and Wales particularly. Um, and then we have an offshore energy side because we lease the UK seabed. So we've been really instrumental in helping the UK become one of the most attractive places in the world. To, um, to invest in renewable energy. And we've got already almost 10 gigawatts of, of um, renewable energy operating in the UK waters. And there's, there's plans for 40 gigawatts more. It's, so it's a really, really important part of decarbonizing the grid, making renewable energy part of what we all get when we switch on, switch on our, our, our electricity. So that's a, that's a key part. But on the subject for today in particular around retrofitting, what we do with the built environment is really, really crucial. So we, like your borough, we have a lot of older assets, uh, heritage assets. If you think of Regent Street, that's a protected, beautiful street, but those buildings are pretty challenging to run efficiently. But we've begun a program of retrofitting so that we really do think about not only the, the built environment, the fabric of those buildings, but the lighting inside, how they operate, and then how we work with our, whether they're office occupiers or retail occupiers to make them work more efficiently. It's definitely ramping up in challenge in terms of the, the ability to do that in a way that meets something called science-based targets, which yeah. everybody will be familiar around, familiar with. So there's not only what we do in our own environment, in our own operations, but what our customers do and then how they use the space. So the challenge of actually going net zero by 2030, which is what we've committed to, is enormous. And we really need to think about how we challenge ourselves, our supply chain, but also then work with our customers and wider community to really find solutions, find ways of working and living more, more efficiently, but also within the planet's means, but also <coughs> thinking about technology and how we can draw on that massive opportunity for jobs and, and skills within the UK and then in time export. And then from a, from a sort of broader perspective as part of a wider 
community. I think we've heard several times today about businesses individually doing things, but working in collaboration with each, with each other. But then also looking at how we can work with our supply chain, really understanding what we can do to stimulate each other into interaction. So one of the things the CBR will be driving amongst all its membership and with other um, membership based organisations and the local authorities in London is really how to how do we issue a call for retrofitting so that by 2030 we're all committed to retrofitting our buildings and that's not going to be an easy 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 task by any stretch of the imagination no. it's a bit of a mixed common mixed playing back some of what we do as a crown state but also some of the things that we really recognize we're going to do by working with other people okay. it's going to require a lot of ingenuity we don't have all the answers yet as you surely nodding because i think we all, we're all looking for interesting ideas and how we can do things through collaboration this isn't an area for competitive advantage this is an area for collaboration to find smart ways of delivering yeah yeah totally i mean if we're looking at place making for the future we can't do it on our own if it's supposed to be inclusive create jobs and be net zero yeah um Afshin, tell us a little bit more about the work you're doing with communities and, and how that might talk to the work around place and um redevelopment etc um, so just to be just to elaborate a little bit about what we do at repowering we specialize in community energy projects and um, that's about working with communities to plan build and fund their low carbon futures so our vision is about creating a cleaner fair energy system that empowers and also provides benefits to those local communities so that looks like uh, delivering community energy uh, solar projects on um, schools and community buildings. It's about tackling fuel poverty uh, by giving uh, advice to local residents who are most vulnerable and generally support often uh, doesn't get to them in the right format. So we work with local champions uh, who are locally rooted and act as agents of change. Uh, we also run some innovation projects which is looking at you know, how could the energy system be different so that the local benefits that, you know, generating local electricity goes into local homes and closing that loop. Uh, and wrapped around all of that is empowering communities through mentoring, training, work experience, working with young people. Um, so I definitely see there is roots in which a lot of the work that we've done, we've worked with the local authorities and um, really pleased to hear about the future growth uh, winners. We're working with the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, the climate change team. That collaboration has been absolutely key in uh, ensuring that the voice of communities are heard. And I feel like, particularly when we talk about retrofit and technical solutions, which are out there and are going to be absolutely key, we have to bring people on board. We have to enable them to also participate in behavior changes is you know the climate, committee on climate change has mentioned uh, you know 60 percent of it is part of uh, behavior change and bringing those technological solutions together communities are key so we really need to collaborate we need to collaborate as communities in terms of co-creating those solutions um, to address those challenges because you know it's a shared problem thank you i, I know that um the lumber sustainable Sustainability Development and Group is also committee is also looking at some of those agendas working with City Hall as well that uh, maybe a colleague will speak at some point. Um, tell me a bit about um, Paper Round, um, Tom, and you've got a kind of slightly different agenda, but clearly you're committed to the work that we're all talking about now in regards to say, sustainable development, net zero. So tell us a little bit more about how you're aiming to do that. Yeah, so just picking up on some of the some of the previous comments. So we're a recycling company, um, recycling for businesses. The Crown Estate is mm -hmm. one of one, one of our customers, um, and what there are great great um, possibilities of London meeting its climate target ambitions through recycling. You get a double win if you don't burn stuff, you save carbon. If you're putting high quality resources into the economy, you're saving carbon that way. So it, it really can deliver. Um, for everybody and it creates good, um, strong jobs in the green economy rather than in the economy of destroying things and through burning. So there's a lot of opportunities in recycling. Um, but fundamentally, it's about persuading people to put the right thing in the right bin. And in order to do that, you have to engage with them as people. You have to engage with their places. They have to believe in the system. Um, they have to have the right bins in the right places. So what we spend a lot of time doing is engaging with our customers 
giving them all the information they need to try and you know, work with their communities, their tenants in their buildings um, to, to perform better. And one of the things that we've looked at recently is getting really good carbon information to them. So we produce quite specific, you know, over the last year, we developed quite specific carbon reporting mechanisms, which tell people you had this much carbon spent on the trucks we sent going to your site. And so that as we electrify, they'll see that carbon number going down. So they'll see the benefit of electrification, even if they have to pay a bit more for it. Uh, and they'll also see, this is exactly what's in your waste stream. If you do this, if you get this food out, if you get this paper out, um, you will get these carbon benefits and they can feed those back into their formal carbon, carbon reporting. So we're very much about engaging with people, engaging with our communities, giving them the tools to try and get the best outcome because it will all add up to a significant, you know, um, delivering to London's targets um, for, for net zero over time. Thank you. I'm going to ask maybe the same question in regards to net zero and some of the work that is happening. It's me? No. No? Okay. <laughs> no go ahead. Go ahead. Um, let's talk about the challenge. Okay. Okay. There's 200,000 buildings in London that will need to be retrofitted or agreed some course of action. Mm -hmm. That's that's a massive task. And I think Gareth uh, had a point as well. And mm -hmm. I think Ravi would just say the same as us. We are passionate about this. We're not politicians. No. We are people. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, talking about talking to our communities, we already do this. We've been doing it for quite a while now. Um, and we know we can only do this if people understand the benefit to them. Mm. And that's, that's really important because we are trying to reach um, nine and a half million people. Mm. And that's a very difficult thing to do when you talk about the world of politics and what's being said and, you know, what COP26 is. Lots of people don't understand that in their world today. Now, I say that as, as the situation I find in Barking and Dagnum being one of the poorest areas in the country. So how do we get those people that are worrying about whether they're gonna heat their own or eat in the coming weeks to then start worrying about air quality? And that really does have to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. And we've got to take it away from the politics of the conversation and start talking about the planet and how we collectively are our people. And we've got some really good examples of that uh, across, again, across boroughs. Uh, London Borough of Sutton uh, are leading the way with energy sprung in full retrofit. The fact of the matter is, though, it's £80,000 of property mm -hmm. because what we haven't done is started the supply chain. Mm -hmm. yeah. We haven't trained our young people to understand where we need to go with that. Now, the government has given money uh, and we're all pleased about that because we need this money to allow us to start doing this work. But I'd be the first to say, and I would hope others would, would follow, that where we should be looking at is starting in what would be our council housing stock uh, or social housing as some people would call it, but the, where the poorest are, that if we can start retrofitting there as a first instance, it allows us to build up a program that allows the market to actually develop and the cost reduce. Mm -hmm. So then everyone benefits. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure we have got it aligned at the moment. Governments gives millions of pounds, but I can tell you uh, when Phil, who leads for us as London councils, when he's talking to ministers, we're not being told that local government is in the forefront of that expenditure uh, within their communities. Mm -hmm. So we have a really big challenge. We have councils of all political persuasion saying we are, we are up for that challenge because we know the alternatives. And just in my borough alone, for the first time in my lifetime, we had a tornado which damaged 80 properties. We've had 20 floods in the last six months. Mm -hmm. This is not happening just because you know, we're not cleaning the streets enough, despite what some of my residents would say. <laughs> um, it's happening because the infrastructure isn't there to manage the situation. So I think collectively, we know it has to start with the homes. As a good society, we would start with the poorest and the most vulnerable. 
Uh, and then that helps the industry to then deliver the outcomes that people need to see for the wider job creation uh, and, and what we want to see uh, as the market taking ownership of what everyone then can benefit from. Thank you. So, so this is about equality as much as it is about climate, isn't it? Yeah. Both things go hand in hand. And if we want to make a difference, it's got to be the, those people most in need, most likely to be impacted. Well, because that's what housing's there for. Mm -hmm. It's there for the, the people that can't afford it themselves. We as a society try and build that so they have a safe and uh, uh, you know, green future. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that helps the market develop the different industries which the market will then put out to the marketplace for those who can afford it it shouldn't be the other way around it shouldn't okay. be if you're the richest you can achieve the best whilst others are still dying far too young and we see that across london in different locations yeah. and obviously in london one of the things we're all saying isn't it it's build back better and fairer yes and we need to remember underline the fairer bit yes. and taking on equality and equity um Ravi, would you just tell us a little bit more about what, what your thoughts are, maybe on some of the comments that have been had by colleagues around uh, how you're thinking around sustainability, when the inequality agenda has been taken on board and we're talking about sustainable development. And then I'm going to open it up to a, a conversation with, with everyone and any questions from the floor and the Zoom, apparently. Yeah, thanks, Murray. I mean, from, from the earlier uh, panel discussion, there was reference to 15 minute cities. And I think at the heart of this city of villages that Durham's uh, claimed credit for uh, is, is that every, every area has got areas that are within a 15 minute city concept. My own borough has got five town centers, means quite a large part of that borough is 15 minute cities. But the bits that are not are the ones that are most reliant on cars. And they are often poorer, often they are ignored, often they're overlooked. And so in, our, in a sense, in terms of the, the fairness of the argument has to be that we have to bring everyone into this under the umbrella of 15 minute neighborhoods. And they don't have to be big cities, they don't have to provide everything, but they have to provide enough to sustain the community. And I think that is the challenge for us to grow what we, sustain what we already have, but in growing our, having our growth, to make sure that growth embeds or embeds all sorts of other bits of infrastructure. You mentioned, um, cultural industries, there is no point in regenerating a large area and keep it devoid of culture in terms of both entertainment, but also creative industry, but also to give that uplift in, 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 in the spirit. I mean, after all, uh, having an evening out uh, at, a, at a place of entertainment must make life much easier, but also living in a neighborhood more satisfying. So that's the kind of challenge for all of us. And we all do it in different, in our own ways, reflecting the needs and aspirations of our own communities. I mean, I know that Darren's uh, uh, kind of huge house building program embeds all of that. Mm -hmm. Now, one other thing I'd add is that in, in context of the climate change, again, it's about taking our neighbor, our, our people with us. We sign up all sorts of charters, create our plans and deliver our, our political and, and administrative objectives. But you have to take the local residents with you. Mm -hmm. because some of them are going to lose out on something that they otherwise have cherished. And it's about sort of saying it's for the greater good, but not only just for the greater good, but transit them from where they are now to where they should be. Thank you. Uh, if yeah, I could, Judith, and then I'm going yeah. to go to Shane. If I could just come in on your point, Ravi, about that sort of greater good, and, and you've mentioned it as well, I think the whole piece around how to, how to have us all see the benefits of what could come from this. I certainly think what we're gonna learn in more of the commercial space, but also on housing in terms of materials, the data, the technology we'll use to, to do retrofitting. I think it can work across the piece. I see sort of parallel processes and being open about what we're learning, sharing, sharing data in terms of how spaces are used, but also information on materials, looking at how we can keep pushing costs down because it will initially be expensive, but we know through economies of scale, we'll get benefits from it. So I think there's a whole piece of how do we share knowledge and be much more open source in our approach on all these things. And then also think of the, the positive benefits there are through um, through just better air quality, through better quality of housing. It's it's going to be better better insulated. So there will be a lot of immediate benefits that people will feel from their quality from our all our quality of life. So I think there's a initially there'll be there will be around all the costs, but actually the end end product is going to be so much better for everybody. Thank you.
Jean, you to... Yeah, I wanted to come in, maybe just be a bit uh, controversial. Uh, I'm sitting here on a panel with uh, leaders of councils, which is great. Uh, and I wanted to point out that um, it's, you know, we've, we've seen over the years how councils um, officers have been struggling and you've had lower budgets and less resource and we've seen dwindling uh, climate, ch uh, climate change teams to sustainability teams. So my um, really feedback is, you know, I, I hope we, with your ambition, you know, stated ambitions and goals that you're investing in those teams so that those uh, teams can actually implement a lot of the climate action plans. Uh, but more importantly, I feel like we are in a climate emergency. What we have seen, though, is not that uh, urgent action yet developed. So we've seen plans and commitments. What we really want to see is action on the ground. And that's what communities want to see, what people want to see. And it just goes back to the comments from young people, which we heard earlier, is that we've, we've heard a lot of the commitments. You know, a lot of climate emergencies were declared a couple of years ago. And that has been great. But what we haven't seen is the you know investment being materialized and the action plans being implemented so there's a sense of impatience amongst residents and communities we mustn't underestimate the understanding that people even if they are uh, disadvantaged and on lower incomes have and knowledge that they have of the measures that could actually help them so you know they've done it they've they've replaced their energy light bulbs they've you know they're you know doing the draft proofing, they're doing all the little patchy work that they can do, but it's, it's that whole scale retrofit that you're talking about, it's so key. And I would also challenge you in terms of procurement and decision making. How do we build social value within that? How, does, how, how do we make sure that those contractors who are then subcontracting and subcontracting deliver valuable, efficient, good quality services? And that's where I would come back to that co-creation co of solutions and working with your communities to really understand that that service is delivered to quality and scale where we're not just bunging in equipment into people's homes and then they don't know how to interact with it mm -hmm. and they're actually not turning on the equipment or they're using it inefficiently and we're not actually solving the problem. So there's so something here about a participatory approach. Absolutely. Use by the people design. for the people. I saw a couple of hands go up. Do you want to? And then. Well, I, I, I'd come back at you and say, in a nice way, without being controversial, I think you're wrong. I think London's councils have actually shown a massive amount of leadership over the, uh, the last five years. Uh, in the last, uh, well, when the pandemic has been on, not only have we kept people alive and safe and delivering, uh, we did also plant 32,000 trees in my borough uh, because we wanted the forest to thanks. We wanted to show people actually there should be a brighter, cleaner life. And I say that in respect that we have the poorest community. We know what they want and we are working with them because we're part of that community. Remember, there are national politicians and there are local community champions. And there isn't a single uh, councillor in this room today that isn't a community champion. Mm -hmm. We live in those communities. They knock on our doors. They tell us very verbally if they don't like what we're doing. Now, the problem we do have is the national politics sometimes gets in the way at the local level. So I know, and, and we've talked about cars today as a situation, at a national level, it's very clear what the government wants us to do. At a local level, though, and this is what Gareth was talking about, there's opportunism in politics where people are going, oh, we can't have CPZs, or we can't have LTNs, or we can't have school streets. Now, all of that is really important for us to, to deliver a clean, sustainable future. Now, some, because there will be some in our community that don't believe it, for whatever reason they don't believe it, we have to try and build a coalition. We've got greening networks. I can tell you it's led by my residents. It's not led by me. I, I'm busy trying to run 350 other services. They lead these services. And I, and I, and I, I do think it's a, a bit unfair on top of everything else we're being asked to do. We are there to empower our residents to give us the outcomes that they want to see, because that's how, in effect, we get elected to be their voice. Gareth, okay. I don't know. Uh, well, see you I, I'm going to move to Gareth, but I am going to just pick up on, on Machine's comment, because I think what I'm tempted to say is I think we shouldn't take it personally necessarily and what she sees with the community she works is a real thing 
and what you're doing sounds great and I wish we could all do more of it but I think we need to hear the fact that some communities despite what you're all doing mm -hmm. still feel like it's not enough but I'm going to stop you there all I'd yeah, say to you is <laughs> some people always say they're not being listened to and it doesn't matter if it's my children my wife or my wider community the fact is I think it's it, you've got to look at what London's councils are doing because each of us are doing a lot in this area. I would congratulate yeah. those who are doing and what you have achieved. So I would I would acknowledge that. Absolutely, and I think we all acknowledge that. That's why you're here. That's why you're on the stage having a conversation about how we can do things better. I'm going to move to Gareth. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on the thing which Darren was mentioning about the idea of, um, of bringing people with us, of explaining why. We are taking certain measures and the, the clearest one I had recently was about school streets yeah. and a man came you know he didn't exactly prod me in the chest but he, he came quite close yeah. um, <laughs> and he said I've never seen a single child knocked down outside of school in this borough in my life and I've lived here for 50 yeah. years and and this isn't going to stop a single child and they said but, but it isn't about stopping children being knocked down outside the school it's about making sure that when they go into the school that they're not breathing in filthy polluted air and the minute that they come out of the school that they're not breathing in filthy polluted air we live under the heathrow flight path but we can't do everything um and that brought him up short and his response was i hadn't thought of that mm. okay and it's it's about the explanation it's if, if you can explain clearly why you're doing something and i think this is where we do sometimes fail as councils is that we don't explain why at the same time as taking the decisions and that that's a challenge for us all i think and, and it's all to do again with all of the measures that we're talking about today mm -hmm. is explaining clearly and succinctly why we're doing things rather than just how yeah yeah so it, it feels like it so people recognize it's for rather yeah. than just decided you know by yes, someone with power mm -hmm. okay um i've got a question about why how can councils be brave now you've kind of are been brave I think just actually doing what you do day in, day out, especially with COVID. So I think I should be one of those people that say thank you to local council and local councillors and people that work with local councillors. I don't think we hear that enough. And it's been hard. I know it's been tough for Bobo as we work with. Um, so I'm going to go down, all the way down, um, from Judith um, to just ask, you know, if you have been candid, please be candid, you're amongst friends. Tell us how councils could be more brave. And, and maybe even about how you could be more brave in your role working with councils. So I, I think I'll stick to how we can be more brave because I, I okay, don't yes. be a bit presumptious to say how I think councils could be more brave. So I think for us it's about you know keeping the pressure on ourselves to to work through what are really difficult challenges. There are not easy answers to get to next year. It's not about buying our way out through sequestration. It is about finding technology. That, and making the budget available to do the retrofit we need to on our properties and, if, and this, this pledge that we want all our members to sign up to and all the other organisations to sign up. So it does mean us putting some cash where our, where our, where our voices are and actually really making sure that we, um, we, we, we deliver and that we work through in a very open-minded way. I think that's probably the biggest thing is to be very open-minded about where the solutions are going to come from. And I think that piece around listening and engaging is something that we could all do. I and mean, I can do that on a personal level more, but I think as businesses and, and as, as working with our communities, really think about how we can involve other people who are more closely impacted by things in actually helping shape the, shape the answers as opposed to thinking we've got to do it, therefore yeah. we need to have the answers. How do we actually involve people, all ages, backgrounds, et cetera, yeah. into really thinking about what the solutions could be? And how they then how things then work because it's not just doing something in if i stick to retrofit it's not just doing that it's also how the space works yeah so you're recognizing lived experience and knowledge equity there you're saying yeah. equal yeah okay yeah. thank you so i'm going to just keep going down just one minute each if you don't mind i i, I can't agree more um it's about people's perspective and it's all right if you are in uh leafier areas of london you, you will find this much easier than those who are the poorest. I just happen to have a borough that are the poorest. So I, I think what we need to do is make sure that they are listened to, uh, totally get that and make sure that when we have the conversation, we try and have that conversation in a way that they understand it. So, you know, you can use all the big words you like, but if it doesn't matter to that person where they live and how they live, it won't connect with them. We've just done a pamphlet explaining, an eight page pamphlet explaining why we're doing what we're doing. On the front page of that pamphlet, 
was the picture of the tornado and was the picture of the floods because they understand that's the streets they live in. They understand that's the place they come from. So it's about being at their level and also saying to government, give us as London's councils the ability to facilitate their ambition because they're all ambitious to be greener. Thank you. That kind of reminds me of a report that was done by the Joseph Roundtree <coughs> Foundation some while ago, actually. And they talked to a number of communities and someone said rainforests are a long way from here. And what they were saying is, we understand what's happening globally, but we also need to understand how it works for us and what we need to. And it's mm. always stuck with me that sometimes we have this language that actually doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Great. Thanks. Ravi. Well, well, I mean, last year has shown how good we are at doing some things. During the pandemic, we were both united as local authorities, but also united with our residents. And I think we need to almost learn from that and say that we need to be just as brave and probably more brave in looking at the climate change in the context of that togetherness that we have with our communities. The other thing is we also have this huge resource of council officer style and knowledge in them, which we do need to, in a sense, prioritize towards this area. And, act, and then weave the whole climate, think climate change into every decision making. Mm -hmm. Just as we have over decades tackled various forms of inequality, we do need to understand that this is a form of inequality mm -hmm. and that we do need to tackle it as, a, as from root and branch way. The last thing I'd say is that by and large, the forums that I go to locally and elsewhere that talk about climate change as a great challenge of the times is sort of populated by a certain range of people. It is not universally exclusive. There are age groups missing, <coughs> there are racial groups missing, there are, there are people with backgrounds missing. And I think our big challenge is to, in a sense, universalize that involvement. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving there. Being brave, gosh, I think we are, we are being brave in many ways. And I'd like to share the story of uh, our work in North Kensington, which is an area of deprivation. And then our journey began in Brixton. So I have quite a lot of experience of working with socially disadvantaged communities. Um, and with North Kensington, five years ago, we didn't have an energy corp, we didn't have an environmental movement, we collaborated with the council, and uh, together invested time in having those discussions, and bringing people on board. Um, we started with a group of few select individuals today, four or five years on, uh, North Kensington Community Energy is a registered community group. Uh, and it has installed solar panels on four community buildings in the borough. It has um, uh, invested £200,000 in, in acquiring those assets, which are in community ownership. Those assets are going to create £75,000 that are going to go back into that community, address, uh, addressing ta um, fuel poverty to uh, offering training opportunities for young people. We've got 200 members, and this is the power of community. This is the power of collective action coming together. And this is, a, you know, it, it happened because of a catalyst, a local authority coming together, investing in their people, working with the organizational night, like repowering, enabling that community to really flourish. So my vision of a braver future is to see more of those groups across all London boroughs. Okay, thank you. And I have to say from my day job, I think one of the things that's really important is that we get both government money but also getting philanthropy oh. actually investing in local authorities at a local level and that's something that, that we work very hard towards for the as foundation for future london for east bank absolutely crucial that we get you know, additional money in for people that um, could do with sharing some of it i think <laughs> okay tom i think the uh, the bravery i want to talk about is that the we should not shy away from the amount of money that's required and that the affluent are the ones who are going to have to bear the the brunt of that money so in a very kind of parochial way in my world to decarbonize the 55 trucks we have driving around london that's going to cost about 10 million pounds a big you know it's, it's a big it's a big number the the cost of an electric truck is about double the cost of a of a diesel truck and we have to pay for that and we have to pay for that in the next 10, 15 years, otherwise we're not going to get to net zero. That is going to cost a lot of money. Many other things are going to cost money. We have to address that question 
um, we have addressed that question. We, we looked at whether we could sign up to 1.5 or 2 degrees, what the investment cycles would be. You know, it's quite scary conversations when you really get into it. You have to go to that level of detail. It is going to cost money. The affluent have to understand and be brave about the fact that we have to pay it. Otherwise, we're all in, we're all in terrible trouble. Thank you. So I've been handed um, three questions, but we only might be able to do two. So it's a question from um, Pauline Castres. I hope I pronounced that right. I've actually got my um, contact lens in rather my glasses, so I'm sorry, Pauline, if I got it wrong. Here's her question. Um, a fantastic ambition, but let's make sure this agenda is fully inclusive of disabled people. I would underline that too. How can we make sure that the vision is supporting disabled people, especially since we're disproportionately affected by extreme climate events? So I'm going to start at that end, Gareth, <laughs> and move forward and if people have an answer. But I'm hoping you are, seeing as that you're very much have a lot of power around how we build the spaces in your local areas. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's always going to be a challenge trying to find the, you know, the precise way of dealing with um, inequalities of any sort um, when you are addressing issues such as this. So if we are, obviously we have all of our um, equality impact, these assessments, but I think we do need to look slightly beyond that. And it's very easy for us as politicians to speak to the officers and ask what they think, but we very rarely <coughs> get the opportunity to ask the people who are getting the most directly impacted what they think. So um, at the moment, we've, we've got a, a new development which is going on um, on Twickenham Riverside. It's been going on for 40 years because of the amount of politics behind it. Um, and we get so many conflicting asks. So we're asked to get rid of cars. We're asked to build in more cycle infrastructure. We're asked to build in more walking infrastructure. And then the question gets asked quite reasonably, well, what, what are you going to do to make sure that everybody can enjoy this new facility? What are you going to do to make sure that people with mobility issues, people with sight impairment, people who have um, um, sensory um, issues in terms of sensory overload, things like that. It's difficult and we are not going to get everything right. Nobody's going to get everything right on things like this. But we do need to make sure that if we're, if we're developing solutions for a global issue, it has to be global genuinely in the terms of the people as well, not just the planet. Um, so it's more listening is, is, is the way forward on this one. And I'm not going to suggest that we're doing everything absolutely spit spot. I'm not even going to suggest that we're doing everything as well as we can. But there are advocacy groups um, that we have who are more than able to give you know, lived experience and shared thoughts. And um, there's a guy called Alan Benson, for example, who is an absolutely first rate disability um, access campaigner. Um, for a one of our local charities and he's, he's a known voice we try to talk to him as much as we possibly can and we do need to be speaking to people who are not just people that look like us or people who move like us but we need to be talking to everybody and taking people's personal lived experience and expertise into account when we're making these decisions thank you i said one by one but actually i'm not sure if we've got time so Sorry. maybe <laughs> no, no no that's not because of you that's because we've got a lot to talk through today um, would anyone else like to respond, and I hope someone else does, to, to Pauline's question about, you know, if we're talking about climate change and impact of it, how do we make sure it's equitable, and how do we make sure that um, disabled people aren't disproportionately affected? I sort of agree with what Gartz just said. In a sense, it is about accommodating everyone, but in accommodating everyone, we are bound to miss somebody. Mm -hmm. And we need to be open to listening to what whoever that is, says that you missed us out and try and find the solution. I mean, the question we've already had is about, you know, when you have a cycle lane and a pedestrian lane side by side, who takes priority? And then if it's all squeezed out of the same space, where does a kind of double buggy or a wheelchair get accommodated? There's are conflicts that we daily resolve and try and resolve. And when, where we can't, we need to be brave and see whether there is another way around it. But it's about listening and being open to being challenged as well as open to new way of doing things. Okay. And, and I would add to that, what we need to use is use the technology mm. to allow people mm. to access so we yeah. can listen. Yeah. So in Barking and Dagenham, we have the BD Can, Barking and Dagenham Citizens Alliance Network, which is an online platform which allows us to listen to all people of all backgrounds with all disabilities. Uh, why have we done that? Because we want everyone to have a voice in the decision making that we're trying to deliver in all agendas. That's why we have a greening network now, 
not led by the council, it's led by residents. Our young people, and it was uh, the earlier speakers, you know, we've got a youth mayor. I meet with her once a month to hear of the problems that she got elected. She got elected more than any other councillor, actually, <laughs> because she's, she was elected by all the secondary schools to be the voice of young people. All the school councils are linked into it. So we have the technologies now, we need to use those. So we try and make the best decisions with the information that's put, put in, in front of us, uh, especially on this green agenda, because it affects every single one of us in many different ways. Okay. I, I would just yes, add, I think I couldn't agree more. I think the technology allows a huge amount of access. I also think the other thing is that we have this conversation. I think Pauline's great to ask the question. Mm -hmm. We know that we're looking at a whole range of, um, of, of people to, to make sure everybody has access to activity. And we've just done something called Purple Tuesday, which was really about creating a retail day where you're actively thinking about how to make the space accessible to people, whether it's because of neurological overload or physical, physical lack of mobility. So I think the fact that we have these conversations more now is really, really helpful. And the other piece is that access to information that allows you to, technology which allows you to get access to information and to engage in the debate much more so you can keep pushing for change and, and making sure that voices are heard. It's okay. really positive. Thank you. So I think we're saying we need to be brave. We've made mistakes. We're listening. Continue to. I don't mind saying the we. Um, but, 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 but also, um, technology has a role, um, but I think if one of my friends was in here, they'd just make sure, really check with technology, that digitalisation is also inclusive mm -hmm. and yeah. that the right data has been taken. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go to um, Rob Day's question. Um, how can you make sure planning um, and new developments don't increase levels of toxic air across London? I think Mesti Khan sort of talked a little bit about what we were trying to do in London, but, but what are your views? Um, whoever puts their hand up first will get to that question. But I'll take that one as uh, okay. I have housing and planning for London, for London's council. So we are doing a lot again. Um, uh, so something we, we call CMMC. So the modern methods of construction, council modern methods of construction, it should be an open source book where we agree the standards of what the accommodation should be like, but the private sector, it doesn't matter if it's an SME, local in our boroughs, they could build the product as well as the big multinationals. So the idea is we're trying to be greener, we're trying to build it faster and, and make it uh, safer actually because it, it, it's a it's a mechanized system yeah. yeah so so in that respect we also got to try and make it carbon neutral uh, and again i think every borough is committed uh, to the tree growth coverage of london mm. we you know we want to be um, uh, a tree city in effect and and that's really important so in planning <coughs> terms i know that members uh, across all political persuasions are looking at the green agenda and what that means and we would like to go further we would like the fact that there are some uh, uh, estates being put forward by the private sector that we feel don't meet our agenda and we would ask government to back us in making that so so we're still being asked to put forward uh, um, estates where they don't have pv and wind and uh, EV charging points as a matter of course. Well, actually every development coming forward now should, because we know we're gonna to have to retrofit in a few years time after, after it's built. So I think we would be braver in there if, if we knew we had the backing. The problem is we don't always get the backing. Okay, thank you. I had the signal for times. Um, so we've got some more questions. Is that right? Yes, hands up please. Okay, I think there's a, someone at the back. Hi, uh, I'm Oliver from the Clean Cities campaign. We're a campaign across Europe for zero emission mobility in cities by 2030, which is completely in line with the Mayor's target of net zero by 2030. So I'm especially interested in uh, hearing from the leaders here today which most significant action you think you're taking at the moment to achieve zero emission mobility in the city by that time frame. So I'm talking active, shared, electric mobility. Don't make me choose someone to answer. <laughs> well, I can jump in very quickly. What we've done uh, first and foremost is that we've, we've, uh, we have a shared um, electric van system for some of our small trades in the Twickenham area. 
Uh, we've given away 14 new electric cargo bikes. And I think that, to be honest, I'm, I blow my own trumpet here, I think that I'm the first London borough leader um, that owns and regularly uses his own cargo bike, and not an electric one either, one which is done with these massive hues of mine to get around. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's important that if we are to um, encourage other people to make change in order to get around, whether it's by e-bike or normal uh, standard bike, is that we, we lead by example. So I, I, I mean, I've had my cargo bike, I went over to Amsterdam to get it from work cycles about a decade ago, and now I use it on a regular basis. And uh, my deputy leader is one of my deputy leaders has got his own e-cargo bike. And if, if we're going to try to encourage more use of these things, we have to normalize them. And that's the thing, the more cargo bikes that people see on the streets, the more people will feel confident to be able to use them, and you will get the pester power from kids, because that's the way forward because kids will see cargo bikes and they'll say, that looks really cool, can I have one of those? And that will put the, the, the spark, usually in the dad's minds, to be honest, because it's, it's a bit of an arms race as far as dad's concerned about who's got the coolest piece of kit. Uh, but it's that sort of thing to get on with. So encouraging businesses, but also leading by example. Okay, thank you. Look, I mean, I, as politicians, I mean, we can all uh, sort of boast about how many cargo bikes we have in our bikes. <laughs> I have so how many. Got many. None. <laughs> I have many. I've got none. So, so I think we're all doing that part of it. Yeah. But I think our biggest challenge is to cut emissions from the housing stock yes. we own yeah, right. and to retrofit of the housing stock we own. Just imagine how do you insulate a concrete frame building with concrete panel walls. In the pre, in the, particularly in the post-Grenfell world, where external cladding is not kind of considered to be the right thing to do. Internal cladding is not possible, it's hugely disruptive. So there are some serious, serious challenges. We've got 40,000 housing units that we are going to have to insulate at some point. You know, and so that is going to be a big challenge. We need to start thinking about how we might do it. And we need to start tackling the easier one first and then and make a start, otherwise we won't get there. Because I think the transport related uh, sort of air quality issues will get tackled largely by innovation and by people's change of habits. But I think the, what is locked into buildings is going to be the, some of the most difficult things to do. What we have done so far in our own areas, one of the large regeneration area around Batsy Power Station, we've got two district heating systems. So they are not uh, they are less cut polluting off the atmosphere than, than individual boilers might have been. So that's a, that's a way forward. But I think, I think there's much more to, to be done, particularly in that building area. And uh, Judith, uh, sorry, Judith, I have a question. And I'm sorry, sorry I'm I just want to come in on this as well. The third bit is we've got to make sure people want to come along with it. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. And leadership is, true, is, is, is key. I, I will go first here as well. First leader to have an electric car <laughs> three years ago, fully electric. Now that was I really, walk. Yeah, I, that's because you're, <laughs> you're, you're younger than me, you're mate. Um, but, oh, the, but the truth of the matter was, Dagenham built cars for nearly 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how toxic is that uh, for, for our community? Well, three of my councillors got doorsteps where we had to call the police over a CPZ. So it's really important that we're not talking to people. We are showing leadership, we are listening, and we are going along with them, nudging them in a friendly way to get them to, to understand the change. So I think all three of us could all, all say about all of this, but we are showing leadership in our own respective ways. And I'll leave you to walk and you to ride your bike. <laughs> yeah, I like the car. There's a very good waste collection scheme by bicycle on Putney High Street, which we which, which really involved go. in. Yeah. Yeah. Good go. waste consolidation, yeah. uh, getting, <laughs> getting, nice getting missions off the road on, on, in your neck of the woods. Yeah. Okay. And I was, just gonna, I was just going to add a couple of small points around things that the, the, the private sector can do in terms of how we develop spaces. So. Mm -hmm. Making, making sure that there's bike provision, the space to put bikes. Mm. We've, we've got a bike um, delivery service in, in Regent Street, for example, but actually redeveloping in a way that uh, people can store bikes, people can have showers. It's a, it's a very different world to what we're talking about from a housing perspective. Also supporting TfL for their electrification. A TfL needs to have 
the investment to actually be able to electrify the fleet and make public transport um, zero carbon. And then finally, just to, just to sort of make a point, I live in Lambeth and I can tell you that a lot of the mums around me are riding cargo bikes and I suspect they're buying them themselves because they're pretty feisty ladies. <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of, there's definitely a lot more bike activity and, um, and people are really looking at how they can get around on two wheels. Thank you. I'm going to seek advice now because I've got a, a sign. Now, I think the sign is that it's time. Um, and that's for me to say thank you. That's right. Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed your candid conversations. Um, and also, I think the bravery to say that you're doing as much as you can, but there's still more to do. Mm -hmm. And then the yeah. other thing that I'm impressed by is that you're all saying this matters and you're going to invest in it. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Right. Are we still having the question and answers on the webinar? They're not happening because we've, we've taken quite a lot of conversations already. Okay. So, is this time for the video message then? I think it is. Um, I'm going to read this out again. The City of London has put together a highlight of the joint work that needs to happen in the UK's City's Climate Investment Commission, and there's quite a lot to do, and it has to be done with London councils and core cities and connected places catapult. This is a really important for climate action, the work that we are going to do, but also about being ambitious um, post COP26 and pre COP26. So I'd like to invite um, Catherine McGuinness. Um, to provide, there is going to be a video um, conversation, a presentation, talk, um, and I think that's about to happen now. Hello, I'm Catherine McGuinness, Policy Chair at the City of London Corporation, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Guildhall today for the London Climate Summit, which I'm sure will be a fantastic opportunity to discuss how London delivers meaningful climate action. I'm very sorry not to be with you today, especially with such a stellar set of speakers and contributors lined up. Like so many of our partners across London, the City Corporation has put together an ambitious climate action strategy, a strategy which commits us to achieving net zero across our own operations by 2027, our whole value chain by 2040, and to working with stakeholders to achieve net zero across the whole of the square mile by 2040. It's a strategy based on science and rooted in action, and one which will see us implement wide ranging changes to our public realm and built environment, as well as create a climate action fund to invest in low and zero carbon technologies and align our wider investment portfolio with the Paris Agreement. We recognise the importance of working with you all across London to ensure that we reach a net zero capital. Partnership and collaboration will be key. And with this in mind, we're very proud to be working with London councils on the UK Core Cities Investment Commission, an initiative positioned to help deliver the net zero infrastructure of the future. Investment is going to be key in London because the changes that we need will require huge shifts in both public and private finance. At COP26, we will be working to ensure that private finance is at the heart of these discussions and we'll be holding a Green Horizon Summit a five-day gathering running alongside the main COP conference that is going to help mobilise global finance and showcase London as a leading centre for green finance. In London, we must recognise the climate challenge that we face, but at the same time, reflect on the opportunities that green and sustainable investment will bring our capital. We hope to see you all at COP26 and I wish you all well for today's summit. Very bright lights. Um, yeah, I think we're wishing each other all well, not just for the summit, but actually the future and all the work that they've got to do. Um, I'd like to invite Georgia, um, Councillor Georgia, um, back to the podium, I think. And also, um, I think you're going to introduce Mayor Shirley Rodriguez, aren't you, as well? <laughs> 
Sorry. Deputy. <laughs> Mayor of the Environmental. <laughs> <laughs> so... I think thanks everyone for what has already been such a wide ranging conversation. I think we've heard every bit of, of the kind of the work we need to do, starting really importantly with, with young people. And I think it, when young people went to the streets and, and marched about the climate crisis, I think that was a real call to action for, for all of us. And they, they did move and I think push the, the debate forward. And we do owe it to, to them to, to take the, the scale of the action that they're calling for. And I think we heard in different ways in all those conversations just how, how much desire there is in communities to be part of this um, and to take action. The, the polling we, we talked about at the beginning, um, I think almost 90% of Londoners said that they wanted to, to take action. And there are so many individual actions people, people can take, what we eat, what we, how we travel, uh, how we shop, what, what energy suppliers we choose. To, we had a bit from the leaders. I've actually um, failed my driving test five times, which I'm now rebranding as an environmental choice. Um, <laughs> uh, well, keep keep that secret. Um, but also the importance of having a real dialogue. And in Camden, we uh, ran a citizens assembly, and we brought together people who represented every part of our community. And there were people in that room who think that Camden Council persecutes car users, and people think that. That we should have banned all cars a long time ago um, and you know those strongly held views and they came together for for real um, debate and discussion um, all the evidence supplied to them over a, a number of, of, of weeks and months and what came out of that was a climate action plan which uh, I think every recommendation had 80 percent support um, and a huge desire from our citizens to 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 get accurate information about the kind of actions that they can take what does make the most difference and to be enabled to to um to, to take action and that's i think the call for us as local government is to really provide that environment to to support those those community initiatives as as we heard but also not you know sometimes not going in we're talking about the climate crisis going in to we're talking about you know a local gardening project bringing people together and, and often uh, what the community say is that once you start there you know the, the energy builds and builds but but it is a it is we do have that huge um uh, community energy then we heard about the role of local government and the powerful action already taking place the the place leadership at local councils are showing the roles we're playing in terms of convening um, as builders of homes as as planning authorities um, the decisions we're taking through procurement uh, the kind of every aspect of what we do as, as local leaders can take action on the climate crisis we heard from government um, and from city hall and we'll hear from shirley um, in in a second as well um, and we heard uh, from business the kind of leadership that, that many businesses are showing, but also that call, call to action to, to go further. Um, and I was asked to, to, to say something about our hopes going into to COP. So I think that we, all, everyone in this room believes powerfully we need to take urgent action on the climate crisis. And I think we all hope that world leaders will, will come together, will keep 1.5 alive, will build on the, the Paris Agreement. But I think as, as London, we're not just going in this time with, with hopes, we're, we're going in with a really clear action plan and the, the work that's been referenced today um, around um, green investment and the work we've done on core cities has kind of shown the scale of a challenge. Um, in Camden, we've calculated just to retrofit our council homes, um, just, just the council homes is a cost of 700 million. Um, and the work that um, London Council's core cities and connected places catapult have done together shows for the, the 12 biggest cities um, in the UK, that figure is two, 206 billion, which is kind of an eye-watering uh, sum. But I think what's really exciting about the work is that they've showed the models that we can, that we can take forward to achieve that. Um, taking a hyper-local place-based approach, bringing together some of the, the things we've heard about, um, local renewable energy, uh, local electricity generation, more efficient buildings, electric charging, uh, waste, community action. And some of those create a real return on investment, some of those don't. But I think if we, we put that all together in a place, there is a real investment case. Um, and as we've heard from, from Catherine and others, there's, I think, uh, real interest in long-term investment um, and I think as government there's so much that needs to be done that we can provide that that long-term plan we will we will need support from from central government that you know we can't get over the need for public investment but I think what what we have is a real coherent and credible plan to 
to get there. And we are already working on local pilots, as we've heard a little bit of today. So um, we, um, yeah, we're, we're going, we're going with, with a plan and what, whatever happens at, at COP, we will continue to do this work. We as cities and local government will, 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 will keep that urgency alive. We will be working with our communities. That won't change. But I, but I really do hope that this, that, that the kind of work we're doing locally will be backed by, by our world leaders, that we will in the UK see a real investment in the kind of projects we're, we're talking about because we as local government are committed, but we've also seen huge funding cuts and we do mm. need to, to, to see uh, that investment. And I think the change that we've really seen and what I don't think was the case maybe three years ago, um, every council was doing a lot, but, but we've seen the way that we're working together, the way that different councils have come together to lead work uh, collectively, the cross-party agreement, I think you've heard today, um, and our strong working as London councils with the GLA and, and with government. So I, I hope, despite the huge challenge we face, we're leaving here a little bit more hopeful with, with a really clear sense of purpose um, and, uh, and a commitment to, to continue the work, regardless of what happens over the next couple of weeks. Um, and with that, I'm really delighted to, to introduce Shirley. We've worked really closely uh, together as, as part of the, the Green uh, New Deal and the recovery work. And I know she's been a real leader in, in, bringing, in bringing this ag agenda to, to the forefront. So Shirley, over to you. Thank you, Georgia. This is just going to be very short and sweet. Um, just thank you, Georgia, and thank you to London Councils, and uh, and thank you to the teams, both at London Councils and, and at the GLA, for, for today's event, which has been absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Maria, too, for, for hosting uh, the sessions. Um, the, the sort of in-person and virtual London Climate Summit is, is really at an opportune time. You know, we're, we're days away from, from COP, and all the signs are, you know, not, not hugely positive, but, you know, we're hoping that it sort of comes out of the bag at the end and that we do get all the agreements that we need. But irrespective of that, we know that cities, communities, businesses are all coming together and already taking climate action and COP isn't going to be the end of it. It can't be the end of it. It is really just the beginning of all the work that we have to do, but doubling down. Um, and uh, I think I was at an event with Phil and what was it? I can't remember what I said, but something doing what we're doing even faster and even better, maybe not so, you know, maybe slightly more succinctly. Um, I just wanted to, to, to just to remind ourselves that, you know, we heard from, from some of the, the representatives of, of young people, you know, the, the people who are, uh, who are going to be living in London long after we've gone, um, and, and their voices are really important. And this is why we, we established um, the Future Neighbourhoods Programme, really so that we can make sure that we're hearing those voices from young people and the communities about what they want to see in their localities. And the polling that London Councils has talked about, uh, we've done similar polling, there's national polling that people are saying, you know, they, 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 they know climate change is here, they're seeing the impacts and they want some action done now. And they know what the solutions are. We've heard that from, from, the, uh, from the panel and from others, um, you know, from the youth representatives as well. So it's really about how do we collaborate and collectively come together to deliver on that. So um, our, our efforts, uh, you know, working with you and through, through, through the GLA was really the Future Neighbours pro programme. So we were so delighted to get so many applications from communities and from boroughs coming together to say, this is what we want to see. Um, you know, we want the future neighbourhoods of 2030, we want them now and we're ready to work on them now. So the two fantastic projects that we've got from um, let me just remind myself, Summerstown in Camden and Nottingdale uh, in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, you know, were, were, were stand out uh, in, in some absolutely excellent applications. So which is why we're funding um, some pipeline work to make sure that those projects that didn't quite make, you know, those two winners um, are able to really um, build those business plans, bring together the communities into projects so that we can, you know, so that they're ready for the next funding round and they can talk to local authorities or philanthropy or mm -hmm. others to get these things off the ground because people can't wait. Um, you'll, do, you'll have seen the latest reports from UNEP, you know, we have less than eight years really to get uh, half our emissions, to get the actions, uh, the plans underway and delivered, you know, not, not just plans for plans, but really action now. And this is really what today's, uh, today's summit, the Future Neighbourhoods Programme, a lot of the work that we've been doing through Green New Deal is all about. So, um, so let's just keep that ambition going. Uh, we're going to carry on working with you all uh, from, from the GLA, but with London Councils, all of the um, stakeholders on the London Recovery Board who are doing so much, because I think, you know, 
we collectively you know own this uh, ambition now and we want to get on with it so thank you very much i'm going to hand over i think to phil who's going to close i think uh phil is my co-chair on uh on the green new deal advisory group and on uh, on the sort of environment advisory group as well uh so showing how closely we're working together but also has some fantastic work in uh, hackney that he can talk about i'm sure thank you Uh, thank you, Shirley. I did joke when it was when you were looking, Maria, for the uh, young mayors in the audience that you were referring to me. But I don't think, <laughs> of course, I was. Uh, I don't think you, you quite were. So, uh, as Shirley said, we work very closely on the Green New Deal, which is one of the nine recovery missions. But we also, I think, as you've seen today, it's a strong partnership across London's local government. It's across party. It's inner and outer London. It's GLA, the London boroughs, and the Corporation of London. And it would be remiss of me not to um, recognise the contribution the city has done, not just in providing the infrastructure for today's summit. We're actually in, in the square mile, and it's run on 100% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So the city of London's done a huge amount to move this agenda forward, and I think uh, their ambition to be the green finance capital of the world will really chime with the work of the UK CCIC. I'm not here to talk about Hackney, but I did want to reflect on what Simon and Susan said earlier. When Hackney decided to launch its uh, roadmap to net zero uh, a couple of weeks ago, it did it in a school with a school council because we wanted to make that connection to what young people wanted to say. And I made a promise to those young people that I would come back pre-COP with other schools and listen to them about what they wanted out of COP. And that's what I will be doing back in Hackney uh, next week before going to COP with many of the people in this room. Um, my task is a bit of a court reporter, an impossible task to pull together all the themes that have been talked about today. But I suppose number one is that leadership from the Mayor of London and that partnership that has been referred to. I think it's brave leadership as well. We talk about the ULES as if it was inevitable, but actually it has been and continues to be politically brave. Mm. I think what we offer as local government, and you've heard it from everyone speaking, is that strong connection to place and social justice. Because it's the impact of climate change and the failure to transition that will take away people's jobs, have an impact on their food supply, cause and continue the uh, uh, epidemic of disproportionality in our health system. The floods that Darren referred to were very vivid and very real for Londoners this year, and that question about how we heat and affordably fuel our homes. So if we don't make that strong link between climate change and social justice, we will have failed. And I think it's Ashin's point about what the world can look like. Retrofit is a huge, big, complex, expensive task that faces us all. And it can alienate in the language that it uses. But when it comes down to it, it is what you're trying to deliver through the Future Neighbourhoods funding and other things. It is about the type of environments that we live in and whether they're ready and resilient uh, for the future. And you can do that in a top-down way that imposes technology that people don't understand, that increases the cost of their fuel and their energy, that leaves nothing behind in terms of jobs and skills, or we can do it with and through local government and achieve uh, the objectives and outcomes that have been referred to. So that's apprenticeships in green jobs and skills. That's doing and collaborating with people, giving them ownership of some of that technology and seeing the transformation in their area. And that is why I think most of us in this room go to COP with local government. We don't do it because we're sector geeks. We do it because we want to combine and work with our communities to achieve that change. And I really welcome what Judith said uh, on the panel about the commitment of the CBI, and I know London Chambers as well, on retrofit. Um, I think it's absolutely crucial that we recognise commercial buildings in the city, but also the contribution that business is going to make. Um, I'll finish on just a couple of points. We held a borough climate conference where we showcased the seven uh, climate change programmes of London councils. And this goes back to the aggregation of the 20, uh, in 2019 of all of those climate emergency declarations and the commitment that London councils made. And we were able to showcase cross-party leadership across retrofit, low-carbon development, low-carbon transport, renewable power, one-world living, consumption-based emissions, so that circular economy piece, the building the green economy, and the resilient green London. And why I'm saying all that is they're led by boroughs of all different shades uh, uh, and uh, political persuasions. And what came out of that conference and the pre-breakfast meeting with, with you, Shirley, was more, better, faster. 
we know what we need to do. Uh, we've got the ideas, we've got the expertise. Uh, and what we now need to do is deliver this decade. And I think the most important thing going forward now is whether we can convince government to invest in that proposition and the private sector to invest in that proposition. We've made a good start. I welcome Paul's remarks. I really welcome the low carbon forum that's going to have local government at its heart. But frankly, it isn't still enough uh, and we must do more. I will finish uh, by saying that I am hopeful. Uh, we take that hope to COP, but we don't stop there. And I know that on every single one of those seven themes, and most importantly retrofit, we're going to reconvene after COP in London with civic society to find the solutions that we need. And uh, the Mayor, Shirley, and myself uh, on the retrofit summit at the start of uh, 2022, and putting all of these ideas into action. So thank you very much indeed. I think we've had a very much a solutions based, which was your challenge uh, summit this afternoon. And I think we can take that message to the world next week. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'm going to be really short because, as usual, everyone said what uh, you want to say. And that's a good thing because it means we're all on the same page. Um, there's a couple of thoughts that came to mind. Eight years is a very sobering figure, isn't it? Um, we don't have long. We don't have time for many more of these meetings. We only have time for action. Um, the next thing is faster and fairer. We are focusing on cities and we're focusing on London because that's where we are and that's a city that we all love and work for. But we have to remember cities around the world are also suffering um, actually by the impact of cities in the north. Um, and that means the northern hemisphere. So it's also thinking about local to global and we see that quite often at a local authority level um, where we work with people from various backgrounds um, ethnicities, cultures, and they have lots and lots of solutions for how we work together. But I think if we think London, we think global, as we're currently doing through City Hall, um, that's really important. But most importantly, let's support each other and let's design in people who aren't in this room to tackle climate change needs all of us. Thank you very much. One last thing, there is food somewhere in the building over there. Um, and if you have time, I would say share your stories. I've learned a lot today, um, and I'm sure there's more to learn. So if you can, you know, gather. If you feel safe, wear your masks if you don't. And let's have a cup of tea, a biscuit, and a conversation. Thank you. <laughs>